geographies, history and photography in colonial India. We, on behalf of Vishwabharati, welcome Professor uh, Forbes for this. Thank you so much for being with us. And we are very eager to hear your lecture, ma'am. We will start with our traditional welcome with Chandan and Uttariya. Today, this lecture will be presided over by Professor Asha Mukherjee. And we are very thankful that our Vice Chancellor, Professor Vidhu Chakraborty, is with us in this India world. Thank you, sir. Professor Asha Mukherjee, welcome into Professor Forbes. Welcome, Professor Shodhar Damodar. We will be having the Vedagana. Kindly rise. This is our will be delivered by the students of Sangeet Bhavan. transmission and assimilation of an ideology and this was way back in 1976 so you see the span of her research on and if you see her CV well if I go on to repeat all the names of the books and the areas she's researched on it will half the lecture time will go but I really want to point out a few special books which we are very fortunate to read about Geraldine and you will get to know also the kind of her expanse of research and writing. So one book which is very popular is Women in Colonial India, Essays on Medicine, Politics and History. So it is one of the very, one of her very uh, remarkable books. Then the other remarkable book is the memoirs of Dr. Mohimubhuti Shen. Dr. Mohimubhuti Shen, from a child widow to a lady doctor. 
So you see her research actually crosses genres of, even though she's a professor of history, she goes into social sciences, she goes into medicines, case histories. Another very important work of hers is a historian's perspective of Indian women on the freedom movement. So a pattern of life in memoirs of an Indian woman by Shudha Mujumda. She had introduced the book, written a foreword for it. Apart from this, she has, of course, it is not her, her area of research is not confined to only Bengal and women. She has also published a couple of books on women from Japan, women from uh, Yoruba, artists, etc. So her interest in women's studies is actually interdisciplinary and worldwide. But I just want to give you a, a, again a few titles of some of her articles which have been published and you will understand the in-depth study she is doing. One is In Search of Elokeshi. Unraveling the Tarakeshwar murder case of 1873. Elokeshi and that Chitra, Kaligat Potochitra is such a, a famous, iconic picture now. We all know about that. And she's done a very good paper on this case of the Elokeshi and the tribe. And there are so many other very interesting areas. One is another. She also edits a series called Four Mother Series on women's writing. And in that, Neera Desai, one of the women, four mothers she calls it, the history and women's studies in India. Then another topic, no science for lady doctors, the education and medical practice of vernacular women doctors in 19th century Bengal. How they were denied entrances into mainstream medical colleges and all that. <coughs> Again, reflection of South Asian women. I won't, I won't go on just the last topic, which also we are going to uh, hear from her today, is an, a way of reading colonial history through photographs of the time. This is, she specializes in that. She's written several articles on studying photographs of colonial Bengal. And today, I think, Jerry, you'll be speaking on that as well. So. Uh, with these few words, I don't think she needs any more introduction, but we are very happy to have someone here, you know, specializing on the history of Bengal and from all the way staying in New York, State University of New York, she is a much more expert than some of us of knowing the history of colonial Bengal. So with these few words, I just uh, welcome Jerry once again. Wonderful to be here. I actually worry that I will sort of um, overdo my trip so that people won't invite me again. But it's lovely to come here. Um, I was here last year for a conference. I wrote to my sister in law and said, Oh, I've arrived in Shantani Caton again. She said, All right, now you're in heaven. So this is how she saw this place. So I would like to thank everyone for being here and for the introduction. It's an honor for me to have the Vice Chancellor here. Thank you, Shandata began the process of writing to me and Asha Mukherjee followed up again last year I spoke at Women's Studies. So that's why I'm worried that I'll wear out my welcome. Oh, and I wanted to say that I put a lot of my publications on the web, so you can get this. I'm about to share the entire book is available. I think it's through academia.com, if anyone wants it. So let me begin. Proponents of visual history insist on the value of photographs for enriching all disciplines. But they always point out that Photographs do not speak for themselves. Although we keep saying that, we have a saying about a thousand words, I think, repeated too much. In a really excellent book called Picture Empire, James Ryan says that photographs are invested with meanings framed by and produced within specific cultural conditions. 
and historical circumstances. He and others who write visual history insist that we look at the context of photographs. So we have to look at many things, and I'll repeat this again through the talk. Technology. If people stood very still for a photograph, it was because often of the technology. Things like the photographers, photographic studios had particular emphasis in terms of what they did and what kind of backdrops they had. Sometimes this is still true. Questions about patrons and consumers. Who wanted the photograph? Who paid for it? And the larger historical context. Now, the greatest challenge, and I'm switching now to say something about women's history, the greatest challenge, I think, for us in women's history has been locating women in the archive. Sources has been an amazing problem. Responding to the lack of archive documents, historians have done things, searched private collections, they've expanded the concept of the archive, so you probably are familiar with the concept of a memoir as an archive. People have developed new methodologies in women's history, including all the ways that you can read documents, reading documents for what they do not say, reading them for silences, for example. And for me, one of the very interesting things in women's history is turning to material objects and photographs are one of those. Collections of family photographs, which is what I have worked on, and not just in Bengal. I use Bengal and Bombay, because using Bombay presidencies, partly because these are the two cities, Calcutta and Bombay, where the first photographic studios were set up. So the earliest photographs you're going to get are coming from one of those cities. And believe me, they were right on target with what was going on in Europe. If there was photography in Europe in 1844, there was photography in Calcutta in 1846. There's not a lag. They were not behind. Now, in this talk, I'm going to use photographs actually from, from Bombay, from from Calcutta, mostly. And I'm going to talk about them in four categories that I think are relevant for women's history, how we can use them. One, I think they can be read simply. We can look at them as documents that give us details. And they illustrate aspects of material, culture, and style. The second thing I'm going to talk about with illustrations is the role of photograph albums or collections in family self-representation. In the family telling itself who we are. Third, I want to talk about them as contributing to a sense of self, building the who am I sense. And fourth, about them as, as devices to connect meaning to images. So this talk has been designed primarily to create awareness of the potential of photographs as historical records, suggest some of the methodologies for using them, and above all, to encourage preservation. I hope tonight everybody will go look at their family photographs. So much of my work has been focused, focused on the public activities of women in late colonial Bengal. Indian reformers, as you know, wanted to ameliorate the lives of what they saw as suffering women. Women they felt had been mistreated by society. In this, they focused a lot of attention on girls who were mid married and widowed very young. Girls and women who were the trapped in polygamous marriages. They, they protested sati, child marriage, the social death of widows, polygamy, and prohibitions on female education. Now, when they encouraged women's education, they also encouraged the formation of women's groups. It was important to the reformers 
that women begin to express themselves, to talk about things, and then to write about them. Now by the late 19th and early 20th century, we begin to get photographs of women, of girls, girls and women in schools and colleges, and somewhat later of women's organizations. So let me talk first about education and what I think we can begin to tease out of photographs. This is 1889 Campbell Medical School. This is, I want to just say that when we look at some of these early records, we can often find lists of names, but we can't always find out dates of, of the, the, the ages of the, the young women. We can't always find out their names, and we usually can't find out much about their families. So I want to talk about how photographs might help add to it. So for example, Campbell Medical School in 1888 was the first program to train significant numbers of women. Uh, Calcutta Medical School had one here and one there and then two, but Cal Calcutta Medical College was very difficult because you needed a bachelor's degree to enter. And very few girls had ever received any school leaving certificate. In this class, and this was a class that was set up for, for young women, they, could, they had to be, um, minimum age was 16, but they could be any age. So there was no limit to how old they could be when they started school, but they did not need any certificate. Any, they didn't need any evidence that they had ever attended a real school. They could take an admission exam. So we know in this class, there were 15 girls. There's only 14 there, if you count them. But this photograph, I can't tell you who is who. I have a list of these 15 girls. I don't know who. But in the records, it tells us that the girls in the class were Brahmos, Native Christians, and Eurasians. So what I want to point out is that sometimes if people see a photograph like that, they will identify the woman in the center as a teacher. She was not. All their teachers were male. None of their teachers were female. She's one of their students, and I think the one in the center is Eurasian. So if you would just look at this, think Brahmos, Christians, and Eurasians. If you look on the right-hand side, we find a number of girls wearing shoes. But if you look on the left-hand side, they are not wearing shoes, which I'm quite sure is the difference between the Christian girls and the girls who were Brahmos. If you also look closely, you can see some of the young women are wearing jewelry, some were married, some were widowed. So we can begin to actually Think about how did women present themselves in at this period. And I want to just say that what this photograph tells us is that there was a, a widespread adoption of wearing the shari in the way that was introduced by Gananandini Devi. She introduced it in the 1870s. And if you'll notice, uh, the props also in the photograph. So there's, there's some similarity. If you can see how many of these girls, I think there's four of them or something, are holding books. So the holding of books become a prop and a sign of education and a respect and a reverence for education. This photograph is unusual. I think many of you may notice. Not primarily because the husband's sitting on the floor next to the woman in a chair. It's extraordinary to find a photograph like this. Often the photographs of the person, if the woman is in the chair and the male is at her feet, it's the son, not, not the husband. But I think the thing one needs to know, and this is why I want to say we need to look at who is a photographer. This was done in Brighton. So this is not done in India, this was done in Brighton in 1872 
And if you begin to look at the kind of photographs coming out of Brighton or that studio, you'll see this was the pose. So this was the fashionable pose. So it doesn't indicate, ah, she's the boss of the family. It tells us something about the photographer. I'm going to give you a few more illustrations of what, what just the kind of visual things we need to start teasing out of this. These are Loretto girls in 1912. Again, I don't have the names of these young women, but what this photograph points out is something uh, Tim Allender wrote in his book about the concern of the British, not with educating all girls, but primarily with Eurasian girls. Loretto, though, in the 19th, late 19th and 20th century is one of the few Christian schools that diverted from a kind of colonial agenda in that its career, its, its academic curriculum became more academic, not just girl stuff. Loretta was one of the first of these schools to begin seriously admitting Indian girls and providing education for the poor. Now in this case, and maybe you can guess, I really think there's one or two Indian girls among the group there. But you can see the dress code. The dress code was dresses, not shabbies. It was shoes, can you see their boots? and look at their hair. The girls had to have tied hair or braided hair or hair in a bun. Now, a number of years ago, I met an elderly lady who was born in 1899, and she told me about her experience of attending one of these schools. She actually went to the American Mission School in Kolkata when, in, when she was eight years old. So this is she went in 1907, and what she remembered was those dresses, those shoes, which she said were so uncomfortable and so horrible. If, you know, think of the climate, think of those laced up boots and, and how hard those would be to wear after wearing sandals, couples. And she talked about hair. She said that one of the problems was the Bengali custom is to bathe in the morning, which means for girls with long hair, wet hair. And hair would be loose until it would be tied up later in the afternoon. What she said is this led to a tug of war, war right? The missionaries or the people who ruled the school said tied hair, grandmother said loose hair. So she remembered being sent home from school because her hair was loose, then her father was angry, but her grandmother was against her tying up her hair. So these, these things, for some people, have great meaning. I'm going to just then turn to this, my last, about education. Now, obviously, the solution was Indian women starting schools for Indian girls that were sensitive to Indian customs. This is the Maharani Girls School that was begun in, in Darjeeling, founded in 1908. So when I was told the story by Paro Bosch, she went there in, uh, she had such a bad experience in Kolkata and then she was sent to this school. In this school, the girls could have their hair loose all day long. However, you'll notice the teachers who are in the second row have their hair tied up. But you'll also, you'll see that they are wearing saris. But there are a couple of shoes poking out beneath those. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Go to just turn now to the, I said the early women's organizations. These are, I'm going to show you two photographs from the 1827 All India Women's Conference. When we write about this as one of the earliest women's organizations, we often overlook social class and caste 
of the delegates and nationality. I think as soon as you look at this photograph, you notice the British lady, actually it's an Irish lady, right in the front. And when you look at other photographs, you start to see the important role that British or Irish women who came with the Raj played in these early organizations. I think the other thing is you cannot but be, I think, really impressed by, say, the social class of these women, which is carried with them in their dress. And I think this is one of my fascinating photographs from that 1927 uh, conference when the, uh, the first president arrived, the Maharani Saheb of Baroda. At that time, the Maharani not only wore a veil to the conference, she spoke as the president, as a veiled woman. Later on, at other conferences, she did not wear the veil. But what is, I think, very interesting to think about is the way in which Hindu and Muslim women work together, which the photograph shows here. And one of the goals of the early organization wasn't to do away with the veil, but to make spaces where women could be free and open to, to have parks for women, to have schools for women who were veiled, to make it possible for them to take part in public life. I, I'm, okay, so my first point was about what I think we can, we can start to look at. We can take these apart and look for things we may not read about in, in, in the documents. But I now want to turn about to how families represented themselves in photographs. So family albums, when you find them, are wonderful. Some people have collections, some have boxes. I think for all these young people here who are digital, <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine pasting photographs in an album when you have like selfie selfies and you have millions of them. And this was, of course, a very different time. Many families had collections that on special occasions, I see some people nodding about their own families, they have had these or still have them, where on special occasions they brought out boxes or they brought out photographs and they showed them and talked about them together. When I did much of this research in the 1980s, so many people are not with us, there were no scanners and no digital cameras. People still looked at their albums, and when I asked them about them, I seldom did one-on-one. -on -one. Usually five or six people wanted to talk about what was in the albums. So let me just start with maybe one of my best photos of a family, which I think is, is absolutely fabulous because it is the entire family a Parsi family, including one of the ans the ancestor who's not with them. So what you get here is a way of then think about the little children. If they were shown this photograph, you would go through and document the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the grandmother, the great grandmother, and it would be a way of knowing who your family was. So I'm going to show you two families as a contrast. Now, because that's, that's a small sample, but I just want you to think about how differently families photographed women. So let me start with, this is the Malik family. Now, this family valued photographs. They really had a lot of them, but they did not want the women to go to a studio because the women were in seclusion. So they bought their own photographic equipment, their own cameras, their own stands. They hired a photographer, a man from Born and Shepherd, who came to the house to take the women's photographs so the women never had to go out. Now, in this photograph, you can see that they don't photograph at one. Mostly, they do not photograph the men and women together. This is, they would, they would photograph the women on some ceremony, a marriage, the women are together. 
And you can see how easy it is to pick out the widowed women in the family. And how you can, you can look at things like the jewelry that the other women are wearing. You can see that they all are without shoes, but they're sitting on chairs. So you can see the family's interest in certain issues of modernity, like chairs, but also its commitment to tradition. So in that album, and I think you will like this, a bride and groom. And this is uh, the family said the bride was seven and the groom was 19. Uh, there are also many, many, this is very common, common in many photograph albums. This is one of the younger brides. This is a photograph, again, of, of, of siblings, brothers and sisters, <coughs> taken because the one in the front <coughs> was getting married. And just, I, I'm just showing you a few to give give you a sense of what you find because you can find other photographs like this and photographs of women with their children and photographs of widows. This is extremely interesting. I have many photographs, many families photograph the widowed women in their families, especially in Bengal. But when I ask people Oh, you photograph, often they did not have a photograph of their father in old age, but they had a photograph of their mother in old age. They would say, we wanted to take her photograph so we could remember her. So they're very conscious, perhaps, they didn't have one of their father. Um, what I rather like is she's seated on a chair, but also this is the only photograph I have, at least, of a smiling widow. She has a little <laughs> smile on her face when this was taken. Um, there are things I think these photographs signal to the children and the family members, and you get a, a, an idea of that. First, this family is committed to female seclusion. They see the idea of women not coming out of the house as honorable, and respectable and something to be valued. So they don't want the women to be lost, they just will adjust and have their photographs taken within the house. An acceptance of traditions such as child marriage, home education for girls, and widows' retirement from social life were part of their family values, their commitment to traditional dress. So I'm going to turn now to a very different family. These are both Bengal. Now the earth, I'm talking about a Sharkar family. So the earliest photograph in this collection was a photograph of the parents of the woman I'm going to talk about, Suniti. These are his, her parents, Mother Sudan and Padma Bai Rao, in the 1870s, in a studio in Kolkata. The father here was born in 1853 in Orissa. He is from a, you can tell the name Rao, a Maharashtrian family domiciled in Orissa. So he became a poet and an educationalist. He adopted Orissa as his home. He also became very influenced by the Brahma Samaj in Bengal. This is, and they frequently came to Kolkata. This is why the photograph is taken here. And he married uh, he married his daughter to a Bengali from the Brahma Samaj. Now, this photo from that early 1870s is very different than most I have from that time because of the age of the woman and also the way they are seated in what we think of as perhaps a kind of companionate marriage. Now, their daughters. Suniti. She went to the same school that I showed you earlier. The daughter was born in 1894, schooled at home at first in Orissa, and then sent to the Maharani Girls School in Darjeeling. There she lived with the founder of the school, Hemlata Sharkar, and she married, later married Hemlata's son. So this is 
you know, keep a girl in your house and she might see, meet your son. So it was a, a love marriage. Now, Suniti went from that school to diocesan in, in Calcutta. Her photograph album was full of pictures. She must have had four or five of attending diocesan. And then photographs when she graduated and with her friends. You can see the age of these girls. She didn't graduate till she was 22 years old. In her notebook, and she left these as well, she had a poem written at the time of her graduation. Congratulations to my sisters all. In caps and gowns, they look so wise and tall. With sons of India, the daughters also stride, some with honors, some with distinction, some plain. So there's a lot, I think, here, but again, you can see so much, I think, about clothing and about their age. She married the next year at 23. We're talking about 1917, when there was still a lot of brides of eight and nine and ten years old. This photograph that you can see here on the left was taken by her husband who had a camera of his own. He took it on their honeymoon. The photograph on the right is of them again on their honeymoon taken by someone else in what I would call a very intimate pose for 1917. Her husband took a lot of pictures of her. These are two taken by her husband. There's a game. These are not done in the studio. So when you see a photograph, you have to think about who took it? What were the circumstances? This was not meant for maybe all of us to see. This is a private, a private, very loving photograph. It's also, if you sort of look at what's Bollywood photographs at this time, it was very fashionable to see the girl looking in the mirror, so you see her from behind. It's kind of like an art photograph that people were taking. The other one is of his wife writing because she became a writer, and this is what she loved to do. There are photographs also. This album is not without children. This is, is Suniti with her first child. Um, and the other one, her first child was born in 1918. Um, then the second one is, again, a family photograph when they were on vacation in Darjeeling. I, can't, I can only show you, this is an extensive photographic album. All of this now is has been donated to the center for the study of social sciences in Kolkata. So if you do research, this collection is there. What I think is interesting is that although there are a lot of family photographs and with children, the photographs of her, of her husband's sort of loving gaze, and the photographs of her as a writer are very distinctive. Just to end that section on this family, there's a photograph of her driving a car. And it's a fake photograph in a sense that she never drove. She had bad eyesight. Nobody in the family would have let her even think about taking driving lessons or get behind the wheel of a car. But in this case, she wanted to pose in a kind of sense of fun for a, 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 as a woman driver. So these are two collections, and this is, but, but I think from my, my more extensive research, they are somewhat representative of the way families might have included women or actually put women in a particular place. There are some families who don't have any women. They just photograph the men. They left the women out totally. And, but there are some families who family trees also leave the women out, so it's similar. I, I would like to argue, though, that what these photographs do is, is they play a role in, for these family members, acculturating the youngers, uh, youngsters about who we are. 
and contributing to the sense of who our family are and what we might achieve. Okay, so the next topic I want to turn to is the kind of role I think photographs in a family play in the role of the development of a self. The women I'd studied particularly played leadership roles. And the question is, how did they get there? How did they get the confidence to stand up in public, to perhaps go to England and sometimes early in the century argue in front of members of parliament? How did they get this, this confidence that made it possible for them to travel and speak up and, and take on issues? Um, so I want to, I think that actually for many of these women, when I go back and look at their albums, that the way they were photographed played a role in their sense of identity. And, and I'm using the work of a, a Chinese author who wrote that, when we remember an event we experienced in the past, not only do we experience being the subject of the conscious episode, but we experience being the protagonist in the memory scene. This is this phenomenal presence of self, that looking at these photographs and talking to me about them, the women reflected on their younger self. This little child sitting on her father's knee was Krishnavai, born 1906. I met her later in her life where she was a rabble-rouser, protester, environmentalist. But she had been a Gandhian, a freedom fighter, and been involved in many women's issues over a period. So I want to talk about the photographs that gave her an opportunity to recall her earlier years and reflect on how she emerged as a very feisty activist. This is a family, family photograph. A studio took this. They went to the studio. 1911, she's on her father's knee. When she looked at it, she was reminded of her father's affection. But she also talked about her mother and father at this time being already reformers in terms of women's issues. This photograph was taken, um, this was taken in 1916. So a few years later, um, she's seated there. By this time, her sister, who's in the middle, who is 15 years old, had had her first child. This photograph wasn't all about celebration. This was a remembrance of the fact that her sister was married at age 10, and that her eldest sister did not want to get married. She wanted to study, and had a child when she was 15. It also made her remember the other sister who was, um, this is from the, I'm sorry, it's, the sister had the babies on the far right. Her other sister, her second eldest sister, is in the center, and she remembered that that sister was also married very young and died in childbirth. So there, the photograph brought out a lot of negative attitudes about child marriage, youthful marriage, and her desire not to be married when she was young. And I've, I've written about this elsewhere. Even though this girl wanted to study, her family took two photographs of her to show, showing photographs, to try to look for a groom. In the first one, the left, this is taken when she was 12. At that time, her father was ill, so there wasn't much chance. It was difficult to find a bridegroom. She just wanted to study. She didn't want to get married, but this photograph was taken in Bombay. The next one, that's on, on uh, I'm sorry, on the right-hand side, was after, it's, it's after her father died in 1922 and she was just studying with a scholarship, but other relatives insist 
that she shouldn't be married because by that time she's 16. She's 16 by the time this is taken. In this case, she looked at that photograph, and I, I have written about this. She said, I looked as mean as possible, so no one would want to marry me. She's remembering, maybe or not, but her whole case is building up who she became. As a young girl, she's saying, I resisted traditional roles. She graduated, got her BA. There's another photograph. She's the only girl in the class. They were all men. She graduated uh, in 1926. But this photograph, rather than her saying, hooray, I did so well, she showed me this photograph and talked about her difficulties traveling to school. She had a long way to go to school, so her brother encouraged her to ride a bicycle, to learn to ride a bicycle. She became one of the very first girls in Madras at that time where she was going to school to ride in the streets. She was criticized for doing so, but for her, what was difficult was Eve teasing. So she remembered, looking at this photograph, her difficulties riding to school and told me that one time she became so angry with the tormentor that she knocked him off his bicycle. She, um, after finishing her, disease, her degree, she started medical school but dropped out. In this case, she was asked to give evidence before the uh, Age of Consent Committee. Again, with this photograph, she didn't talk about who else was there. You'll see she's standing next to Rameshwari Nehru. She didn't talk about what she said. She talked about what she wore. And how difficult it was as, again, a woman at that point in the South. She was old enough, she should have worn a nine-yard sari, but she wasn't married. Only married women wore nine-yard saris. So she said she made it up. And she looked at the way the women at the Theosophical Society tied their saris. She sort of imitated that. She sort of put it together. And she made up her own way of being a single woman, a single woman dressed decently. And this is just the last one I'm going to show you of her. And this is, um, she went to Allahabad where her brother lived and his wife, and she began teaching in Crossways Girls School. Um, at this time, her brother and sister-in-law were very close to Gandhi, and she became a member of Girl Scouts. What she remembered again was how they did not wear the scout uniform, but put on a sari, how they rewrote the pledge so it was God save our India, not God save the king. And how even through this group, they managed to protest their status as colonial subjects. Now what interested me was that she, she, this woman also wrote about herself, but these stories about how I became the self I was, was very related to a photographic history that helped her how to think about her own activism. So I'm just going to turn finally to something about the way photographs, and I've already been talking about memory and photographs, but the way people connect meaning to images. Um, this is a family photograph. It's the father is seated here at the right, and his, his sons and daughter, uh, are there for this luncheon. His wife is there. This is from Sugar Majumdar's collection. What she remembered was, if you uh, look at this, on the left, there's a young woman, and behind her, there's a man sort of seated out from the group. He was not there. This is one of the brothers who didn't make it to the luncheon. But he was, and I'm using a modern term, photoshopped into the photograph. I find many photographs that are doctored from this early period. So when Shuna looked at the photograph,
her, even though this was years later. She doesn't look at it as a family gathering, but remembered and talked about the fact that her brother was not there, even though the photographic memory was that he was there. I, I want to just do another Shunda Majumda photograph, which is, I think, very beautiful. But when she looked at this photograph, she remembered that she had been diagnosed at the time with breast cancer. So this very elegant and I think extraordinarily beautiful photograph could only be seen by her if all it evoked in her were memories of, of dread and pain. Another woman who showed me this, Kaleni Malik, who showed me this beautiful photograph of her receiving her MA in 1936. Actually, she already had six children when she received her MA. She went on to get a PhD and another child. She did not remember joy in the achievement, but she remembered sexual harassment. As a young married woman who had gone back to school to do her advanced degree, she remembered people leaving love notes for her and how difficult this was and said that at this time she knew she wanted to do a PhD and the man she chose to guide her had impeccable credentials. She chose him because everyone said this man never harasses women, he's a good advisor, he has a very high reputation. I'm just gonna give you another one that it's so strange because the memory has nothing to do with the image. This was Renuka, Renuka Mukherjee, later Renuka Rai, who was a student at the London School of Economics in 1921. Instead of recalling her, her program, her classmates, or even living in London, she looked at this photograph and said, at the time, I was very much in sympathy with the revolutionaries, and I was carrying a gun in my purse. I, it, it, is, it was a sort of an astounding moment because this woman later became a minister in the West Bengal government. So I hope this gives you an example of how I think how photographs can have value way beyond illustrating or supplementing a text, like here's a picture of Kanbini or something. But again, as I've said, we have to look at many things. We have to look back at the circumstances. And actually, if we can listen to the subjects, we might get stories that have nothing to do with the image itself, but stories that are very important. But we have to look at so much. We have to treat these as documents that need a, a tremendous amount of research around them. Now, in cases where we can't talk to Renu Garai, who, for example, is no longer with us, as there's a very good historian, Tobiasen, who's talked about visual readings. She asks us to think like every photograph involved choice. Not only what was taken, but what was kept and how it was preserved. So she said, if you can't access the subject, you can look at many other things around it, incidental things, buildings, furniture, and like Bordeaux, she connects photograph collections to the nuclear family as symbols of family solidarity. Photographs are especially interesting, I think. And not because images can be read for truth, but because they invite telling, because they lead us to more questions. And, and there is, in women's studies and women's history, a lot of focus on, on trying to save those small stories that might be lost. However, I want to end with the idea that there is a lot we cannot learn from photographs. I'm often asked, where are the subaltern? Where are low caste people in my photographs? So I, I chose this, just, it's Kurk, so it's from Western India, but in this case, you get what I find in many photographs. You can see 
see the woman in the center. Uh, you can see she's got three children and two dogs. And then you can see there are five servants in the picture. The servants outnumber the family. Now, in this case, it's not unusual to find this in photographs, but these subjects have no names. The woman has a name, the children have, have names, but not the people who work for them. So, I'm going to just show, this is just kind of picking out where in my photographs, except one up at the top is from a sort of colonial studio photograph of, of women washing clothes. But the other ones, so the man when they're going on the picnic, holding the, holding the pony, um, driving the car, the aisle, the maid servant with the daughter, I'm finding lots of those. However, when I ask people for names, do you know the name of your driver when you were young? Do you know the name of, in, say, that central picture? That woman told me her maid was always with her. Her maid appears in many of the photographs when she's a child. So I asked for a name, and she said, I don't remember. Now, if, she, if you'd asked her that question when she was 10 or 12 or maybe 16, she would have remembered. But while people tell each other the names of the uncles and the cousins and the great-grandmothers, they did not tell their children the name of the people who worked for them. So I think these photographs are perhaps going to tell us something, that, but they're not going to tell us much about the subjects pictured in them. So I, I want to say that the photographs that I've looked at, they're limited in terms of what they can tell us. There are certain things we can ask, but other things we cannot. I think, though, they really help to understand more about the texture of the lives of the women who first entered public life. Thank you. What could we find out? And what we have is an extensive collection of photographs of, I'm using this term subaltern, but I think you all know I'm thinking not the highest caste in classes, but all the other working people. Um, the British documented them and they sent out, so they, they did these sort of cast and tribes books. And I've looked at many of those, both uh, British Library has a, an extensive collection. I've gone through many of those. So they will, they will document them as in terms of, you know, or at this particular cast. And they will cast or they'll something, um, these are the weavers of some place in Bengal, or these are the people. And they will show often the women, or, or the women and men, but they are posed photographs. If you look at a lot of them, you'll think, I saw this piece before. So you dress them up in different costumes, and you give them the props that the British associated with those people. So I feel that I'm very, I think I'm very suspicious of them there again, that like, oh, here's a, Here's somebody you can recognize because they're going to be wearing these kind of bangles and this kind of dress. But I, again, it's like somebody who decided on that. So I don't think it tells us very much ab about them. And I'm very suspicious of to what extent they're using models for those. Um, I've worked a lot in the last few years with a collection of photographs done by a British a Baptist missionary in Nagaland in the 1890s. And he is the first amateur, not the first uh, trained photographer, because the British sent out officers to the Naga Hills in as early as the 1870s. But in terms of the amateur, the man with the camera, right? This man, Perrine, is the first to go into the Naga Hills with a camera. And he takes a lot of pictures of Nagas. But again, and he calls them kind of candid shots. But he's taking the before and after. So if he's taking the Nagas before Christianity, they're like picking lice out of each other's hair. 
Or, yeah, he's got one photograph of people like picking lice. He's got another photograph of one man cutting another man's hair with an axe. Right, like, oh, this is how they cut hair. So his photographs, and sometimes the captions don't make any sense. Um, so, so he's a game, the people don't have names, they are examples of primitive people before Christianity. After Christianity, they get names, they're all dressed up, actually they're dressed like Bengali, um, Bengali professors or students or something. They're wearing dhotis, they're wearing, um, they're wearing nice jackets, they're standing up straight with chairs and books. And then they have names and now they are, they're real people before they're savages. I, I think it's going to be very hard for us to think of those photographs telling us much more than how those people were viewed. I, it's, it, some people, one of the things we're looking at is, okay, what, what did they wear? You know, how did, what kind of a shawl did they have? What was the design on the shawl? Because that might give you something about particular weaving. But I think it's very difficult. And I've just been reading about um, some of the later, there's a lot of anthropologists in, in the Nagas in the 1830s and 40s. And there's a really good recent book that, that goes back into field notes and talks about how they, how they posed people, how they did not want to be posed. So I think we have to be very suspicious of of some of those kind of documentary photographs. Yeah. Oh, and I'll come maybe studios later. Yeah. Oh, okay. Take all the questions. Yeah, because I take two of them. Thank you, Jerry, for your excellent presentation. That is very really good. But I have a few observations. Not so much questions, but observations. You talked about silences. You said this is one area where there is a very big silence. Because um, uh, what Shopper Banerjee would say, uh, like, uh, you know, my friend, that domestic servants, uh, we hardly get any information on them. So when you showed us this picture, this photograph of somebody riding a pony, somebody, you know, opening the car, that kind of thing. So one could also interpret it as an extension of a representation of kind of wealth of these people because it is not so much the intention of photographing these uh, subalterns quote unquote i won't use this word but still uh, and uh, secondly who were actually uh, these uh, you talked about uh, the uh, the successor or family members going through photographs, but I am quite curious about uh, this fact, whether these photographs of this category of people, the social composition of these people who are basically the elite, whether these photographs were shown around in clubs or among their English friends, because this concept of attaching a servant to the child, this is very much the Western concept of the governess and that kind of thing. So would it be a reflection of their social position? That would be uh, one thing. And uh, secondly, uh, when you talked about these photographs, we don't find any, uh, 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 this particular in Western India, and all, it was basically the Parsi families that you showed. So where uh, domestic servants were more uh, apparent than others. Would we have some questions from the students? Actually, I am from textile background. This is very interesting. <coughs> the, the issues there's an in the textiles. You have any idea about uh, the textile design books like that? Uh, you have any idea of what? No, textile, textile. textile design. Oh. Dress pattern. Dress pattern in Bombay and Bengal. In 1817 or 1827, like that. Okay, good. Uh, yes, please. Actually, I, I yes. wonder why that uh, the term colonial is used in the title of that whole thing. Well, what, 
what these photographs have to do with the colonial, if you omit the word colonial, what difference is there in your text? All that, all that. Okay. Yes, next. Yes. Uh, uh, some of the uh, observations I made, uh, as uh, my fellow uh, sir said, uh, if we take out uh, uh, from, uh, if, if we convert black white picture from black white to color, the scenario of India is still today the same. Of most of the picture you have shown, all the, only the difference is black, black white picture and the color. Next, my uh, observation is that when we talk about the colonial India during that time. Uh, we believe that the caste system, in India when we talk about, especially about the women, we cannot neglect the caste system and if also of the Adivasi and tribals. But that thing is mis mis missing out, uh, but when you are propagating uh, your own presentation on the women. And uh, after that also the population of the caste is uh, mostly the leads and the tribal are higher than the general caste. And during that time, the pictures, uh, the photography, the affordable was only was with the elite class. Uh, some of the fellow has uh, pointed out. So I still uh, have uh, some problem in that. And uh, some of the picture, one or two picture, uh, you have uh, confidently uh, uh, concluded that the women who are wearing both uh, is a Christian and not wearing is a. Uh, not Christian, but some of the picture uh, is there where women were actually wearing a uh, boot. But how do you arrive to this uh, uh, this one conclusion that women who wear is a Christian uh, and other who were not wearing was not a Christian? Other uh, mm, uh, not the other observation which I made is uh, there is a mixing in uh, your slides which makes the. Uh, the audience very confused. Like you started with the uh, education and then the family, then again the some achievement of the education concept, which uh, which uh, make us troubling in the deriving the whole propagation you want to make. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, 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 suggest one thing is that when we talk about the mainstream India, the Central India, we always try to look at the nicely culture. And if we look at the Rajasthan, uh, Patharu Marudesh, if we look at the West Bengal, the literatures. But during that time also, when we look at the tribals or the uh, Adivasi, we always try to take the picture of head hunting. We always try to the, look at the picture of the women who do not wear anything. But uh, as far as I know, the tribal, the indigenous people also had their uh, work, very wealthy heritage not less than the mainstream and central India. So there is a mispropagation happening and we cannot miss out when we discourse about the women of that time. Lastly, I'd like to know what type of the method methodology you have used to collect these pictures and deriving the whole uh, conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, yeah. um, I was wondering about the uh, whole idea of visual self-construction <coughs> and whether it's possible to plot how uh, a transition is it all from, say, painted portraits to photography? Uh, is it something that you can understand only in terms of technology? Does something fundamentally change in, uh, and in the socioeconomic matrix as well? And what, what happened to paintings once photography came? What happened to the idea of families having themselves painted or individuals having themselves painted? Thank you. I was thinking our students have some questions of clarifications received. Like, yes, please. Yes. Follow up. You can raise your question in Bengali. There's no problem. We can translate. She wants a mining. Yeah. She wants a mining. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
expecting a lecture on what are the colonial position, what are the women's lives position in colonial India. In your uh, photographs, I mainly observed the women from the elite classes. So, are they were the majority who were the uh, were the part of the women of the colonial India? I think the uh, deprived part of the woman, what we expect to be the how the woman was treated in the colonial times of India. Uh, I was ex expecting to be uh, to account to be some kind of pictures which actually shows the, how the women were treated uh, in lower caste or how the, they were underprivileged and deprived. Whatever you showed was obviously the elite class people and how the people. Uh, was coming to adjust with the Western positive cultures and the education systems and how they were adopting the Western uh, dressing codes and all the educations. But uh, is, is it so key, the pictures of the deprived class and how actually the Britishers and uh, the Britishers and their resources used our uh, resources and the actual position of the women who were actually deprived was not framed or not documented because I didn't find any kind of such pictures which showed the deprived women and the women from that class who actually survived because of the colonization of India. Thank you. Your depiction of the women's condition during the colonial era through photograph was indeed audible. Uh, I have two, three observations on that. Number one, uh, it would have been uh, perhaps you are still continuing with the war. So if you can include some action photographs because uh, by 1860, gradually, uh, there was, uh, the visual culture was increasing in India. And by 1890s, there were more use which has started. And by, uh, if we look into the Indian Congress conferences, and then some other conferences and then some women's conferences also, not that all India level which you have shown, I'm talking about some other conferences. There are some action photographs. So that can give uh, a better picture, a complete picture. Uh, we have seen all portraits, we have all seen family pictures, and normally family pictures have a tendency to be more class oriented at that point of time. Because at that time, photography was not a democratic medium. It was an aristocratic medium mostly. So, um, if we try to make a depiction of history during that period, uh, if we get those sources of action photography, that would make better. Point number one. Point number two, regarding the some photographs in the Naga area. See, Naga is a generic term. All the tribes, there are several tribes, and every tribe has their unique differences. Like in, in Sharbia or Czech Republic, you would find that all the denominations of the charts are different, and you can find it when you look into the chart set. The same way. But that's not possible for a person like who photographed it. And these sort of photographs have been shown as the photographs representative of them. The time has come when we need to bust that image also. Thank you. Okay, I think we can have, okay, yes, I've some lot of questions, so I'll try to get them. So let me just start with this whole um, question of what I have, what I'm talking about. If you look at the history of photography in, in India, and actually uh, the, the question about um, portraits, there were never that many portraits of women. Portraits were even more expensive 
than photographs. So actually, um, when I sort of look at families that, that had portraits, they tend to be very, very wealthy, very, very even higher up than, and as photography became less expensive, say the Browning camera that comes in after the 1905, makes photography more accessible to people who don't have as much money. Who, and, and I find then very few people who had photographs and extensive ones also had portraits. So, um, but it's, I'm not an art historian. Okay, when I look at photographs, the history of photographs in India and looking for women, the earliest photographs, as I mentioned earlier, are these castes and tribes. And they are done by not just British photographers, but by British and Indian photographers. Remember there is a number of Indians very well trained by the middle 1850s in photography. And they, they also work and also compile these books or collections called Castes and Tribes. This is where you will find the, the picture of women and men of lower castes and middling castes. Those are stock pictures, those are examples, those are illustrations. In many cases, I don't think they represent anything more than a British view of, of these weavers or, or these um, people who herded cows or of these fishermen. I think they are the British view of them. And so they're not very useful. They have no names, they have clothing, they have artifacts around them, sometimes a house. We don't know if this was real. We don't know how much of it was, was kind of artificial. All right, then when you look at looking for other photographs, I actually started this project years ago, looking for examples of what was happening during the freedom struggle. We know that there, and particularly women, we know there were women involved in the Swadeshi movement in 1905. We know there were women who, were, who went to jail. We know there are women who, who joined with revolutionaries early in the century. We know that there are thousands of women who marched with Gandhi. We know that there are women who participated in sports early, early in the 20th century. I will be really pleased if somebody can find these photographs because I went to all kinds of archives, libraries, museums, and newspaper archives looking for these, so 40 years ago. They are not there. They really are not there. One of the things one becomes aware of is how expensive it was to print a photograph in a magazine or newspaper. I was just today looking at, um, I was just looking at a, a journal from 1910 when I was in the library. There are no photographs. There really aren't photographs. So things we think are there, aren't there. And again, if you look at many of the books on early schools and so on, they have those portraits. I mean, you can all sort of imagine Kanabini Ganguly, the first doctor to graduate from Calcutta Medical College. We have one picture of her. And that's the one that's reprinted over and over and over again. I don't know when it was taken or why or by what studio. So the difficult, what I did was I turned to family collections actually looking for examples of women who did things. Even in terms of the women who marched with Gandhi. Nehru Library has these, go to Sabarmati Ashram, they have photographs. They often have no names of the women in it, and they have women marching, raising a flag. Their faces are not very clear. You don't always know when it was taken, who took it, or who was involved. So I started looking at family collections. So all of these pictures from schools, or pictures I didn't show you of women coming out of jail, or I have a photograph of women raising a flag, they were in family collections not in archives, not in libraries, not in museums. They were in family collections. So actually, because of the cost of photography, and because people had limited money, and because they were the people who 
were participating in, in a lot of these things. Social movements, political movements, were from the upper middle class. Now, not that there weren't, there were lower, many, many people marched with Gandhi. They're neither photographed, nor are their names listed. And you can sort of check this out by going to, going to the documents of the time. We're missing people, not just in photographs, we're missing them in print documents as well. And um, thank you for mentioning Shapna Banerjee's work. That's why I started to look for servants in photographs. Because Shapna asked me, do you find anything? We unfortunately, if the lower orders, whatever term we use, I'm using subaltern, if the non-elites or the non-middle class and so on are in photographs, they don't have names and they don't have identities. They are crowds. So it's, it's, it's kind of the problem. Shabna Banerjee searched and searched and searched to recover the story of a, of a woman who worked as a domestic. She, she, she couldn't find it until now we have those stories. Now we have stories of women as domestic. We're not finding it from 1920, and we're not finding it from 1850. So, so there's a huge problem with all of these topics. My point was that we also have problems with elite women and middle class women. They are left out of history. So I'm not like pretending in, in this talk is really only where I think we might look at photographs and how we might look at them in this period. Um, so there was a question about what's colonial here? The period. I'm only, I'm stopping about 1947 because things change a lot. Now, um, I went to Bangladesh at one point and was looking at photograph albums there. Many of the family there in Dhaka, it's a later period, it's the 1950s and 60s where you find that. And for a lot of reasons, I want to focus on the earlier period. Um, and also because the activities of the women that interest me were associated with an anti-colonial movement. So if you go into post-colonial, where I think there could be a lot more work on photographs, uh, and I think this is where, there's no reason you have to stop at 1947 if you look at photographs. What are the photographs that people were taking in the 1980s? Who was taking them? How were they developing a family album? Were they developing a family album? So I think, I think my idea, is, my point was just to think about how we might pull apart photographs and how we might take them apart. There's no pretense here to talk about all classes and class. In terms of, of the Northeast, I only mentioned the Naga Hills because that's another example where we have photographs without identities. We have photographs that were meant by some somebody to illustrate something about those people. They are not photographs by the people who want them taken. Uh, the ones I'm looking at, these families wanted these photographs taken. At least somebody in the family, maybe, maybe, maybe the, the patriarch wanted these photographs taken. Um, okay, I'm messing up. Question, no, what textiles, I know nothing about except what women have described to me about what they wore. Yeah, so I can't Actually, say much about it. experience, whatever, yeah. Not much about textiles. They talked, a lot, women talked to me in Western India a lot about the, the Parsi, sorry. Actually, I only have one photograph of Parsis here. The other people are not Parsis, but in, in Western India, wearing a Parsi style sari became very fashionable. Yeah. Uh, Actually, some women talked to me, one woman in one family, how after her husband died, she made a living doing zari work. I'm sorry, she was Parsi. And it was, it was sufficient enough for her to support two children. But not much about that. Um, okay. Is it, in, right. is it in Bombay only? Or? Okay, in, in, when I talked to people in Calcutta, they talked a lot about how they wore the sari. 
and what they wore. And actually, the stories women had about saris were a lot about, uh, there were some stories about after widowhood. And if they were still involved in women's organizations, what would they wear? And whether they would dress more, what they said, more traditionally, like a traditional widow, or if they were traveling, could they wear a, a, a sari other than a cotton, white cotton one? Could they wear a silk sari say, for travel? Uh, but no, there I didn't get much about textiles. So I didn't ask for okay. Um, okay, a question about, okay, and I'm sorry if the talk was confusing. Um, okay, the reason I said the boots were, I think were Christian, is I said that in one photograph where there were 14 girls and the identity of them is mentioned in the text. They say one Eurasian. And I'm guessing the person in a full dress frock is the Eurasian. They say this many Christian girls and this many Brahma girls. Um, later on, in all the Christian schools, all the girls attended, whether they were Brahmos or Muslim or Christians or um, Hindus, they all wore boots if they attended those schools. So it's just in the one photograph from 1889 that I think we can see the boots have an association perhaps with Christianity. And that's partly because the schools for girls, the early Christian schools for girls, insisted the girls wear shoes, right? wear boots or shoes of some kind, not traditional or more traditional, or, or also that they be, have something on their feet. Um, I, I, there were a lot of questions there, I think, about cast and again, we're not, if we look at photographs from this era, we're looking at, um, I'm not sure, okay, I wouldn't call them elite because some of the families that had fantastic photograph collections were very poor. But they had education, they had had professional jobs of some kind, but sometimes school teachers, if they had big families to support, were not rich. They could be quite poor, and if the man in the family died, the family became quite poor and dependent on other people. But photographs were something that some people believed you should have, even if they were difficult to afford. So I wouldn't just call all these families rich. And that's, there's a difference. Um, okay, some of your questions I was gonna say, oh, I talked about this in another talk. <laughs> I have another talk on that one. But this was just to suggest some of the things I think we, we, we might be able to ask of photographs. So it's, it's really just a, a, a suggestion of that. Um, one question I didn't get to, perhaps, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions, I tried to write them down, um, about studios. And studios really, some of them, once you see the photograph, you can really clearly see it's marked. Someone mentioned Gordon Shepherd, but there was also D. Ratan in, in Calcutta. There were certain studios in Bombay that were famous for doing this or that. Uh, one of the interesting things was I have families that were photographed in two studios. Totally different photographs because the studio demanded it. So when we're looking at a photograph, it may tell you more about the ideology of the studio than what the person wanted. This is why you try to find out as much as you can. <laughs> um, well, I must thank Professor Garen Fo for giving us such an exciting and interesting presentation. And I suppose this is just the beginning, and it's in a way it's an eye-opening kind of uh, exercise where the whole history of women is actually seen through the photograph. Surely, it's a very particular kind of period for which she's talking about. Uh, even if you don't want to call it a colonial period, but the period since the photography started. And it is the period from the photography started to the period 
uh, when this uh, moving camera and video came in. So you can see that this is a very limited period which she's talking about and she's developing a kind of history and interpreting the history of women through the photographs. And this is very exciting and very interesting for my perspective, I mean, for all of us. And um, I mean, we might differ that, you know, how she's interpreting, whether the shoes are sort of a sign of Christianity or, you know, sort of poverty or elite. But, you know, this whole vision of uh, looking at their women's history through the photograph and reading the photograph by, itself, by yourself, now here perhaps you make a distinction between the reading the photograph of by the person himself as she was talking about some of the photograph where she traces the history of the person by her own, own self. The person in her own childhood interprets her own photograph, you know, maybe at a later stage. So as it happens, you know, the photographs is as a memory. We all know photograph is nothing but a memory. Now, memory is surely, but also she's talking about identity of the self. Now, this identity of self, which starts from the photograph, from the childhood, I mean, identity of the self can be of different ways of understanding of the self itself. I mean, my memory as a child, and you know, the memory of the childhood depicted in the photograph may not necessarily match with the memories you know, which I have right now. So, there might be some contradiction. So this could be negative. The same photograph, I can read it from negative perspective and also from the positive perspective, you know. I mean, like, well, these are the problems which I over, sort of, you know, uh, uh, I could get over at this. And then I might have the negative. So memories by the self itself can be read in a different way, you know. So, uh, but then it's interesting to see the memories from others' perspective, you know. I mean, the photograph, for example, the photographs you were showing in the beginning, you know, not the person himself or herself interpreting, but the photographs are inter interpreted by the researcher, for example. The researchers might have it their own limitations you know, of reading. For example, I mean, like, not even having shoes in the photograph, you know, that's not a sign of poverty. That was a, that was a kind of, you know, tradition. That was the, you know, women were not supposed to, especially the widows, they were not supposed to allow, they were not allowed to put on shoes, you know. So this is tradition and culture and a lot of baggage which is at the back of and reading the photograph in that particular context is extremely important perspective. So definitely it's an extremely complex phenomenon, but thank you so much for bringing us our attention to this aspect of it. Thank you so much. So now we'll have uh, perhaps a thank, thanks from Shruti, and uh, then, yeah, then we will continue. Let me take this opportunity to thank you, Professor Forbes, for such a beautiful and very uh, enriching uh, presentation and I thank everyone who are present here for uh, giving your time, valuable time and we are really very successful with our uh, Vishwabhati lecture series. All of you are coming regularly. Thank you so much. I thank the Central uh, Library all the staff over here for giving us all the facilities that we have used today and of course Shangya Bhavan for their main kana because they are very busy for their Vasantotsa. I thank everyone. Thank you sir, sir for your presence. Thank you everyone. Namaskar. Please join us for a